After months of relative calm and peace from bandit attacks, there has been an upsurge in cases where they unleash mayhem in several communities. Some of the states affected are Niger, Kaduna, Kogi, Adamawa, and Bayelsa, killing several persons and kidnapping no fewer than 34 persons, including two police officers. Bandits also made away with arms and ammunition. Although security agencies have imposed curfew in some of the locations, this has caused palpable fear in the minds of Nigerians who may not be able to sleep with their eyes closed. We're joining us via Zoom from the UK to discuss these security issues is a preventive terrorism consultant and president of Africa Security Forum, Timitokwe Uludu. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on TVC Breakfast. Good morning. And it's good to morning. see you again. Good to see you after Thank a while. You. <laughs> right. Now, just like we have mentioned, there has been relative calm for some months now, and now we are beginning to see a resurgence of these attacks in a number of states. What do you interpret as uh, the reason for this? Okay, thank you for having me once again. They've actually not been any calm in the kidnapping. Uh, at least people, more than one or two people are kidnapped on a daily basis. The challenge that we've always had is our statistics. All the statistics that we are relying on are statistics given to us because individuals have either reported that story or we are aware of it. As we speak right now, in the next 30 minutes, another person will be kidnapped in this country, in Nigeria, really. So it's not like the the incidents have stopped. I think what has happened is that the news has shifted away from discussing the issue of kidnapping and adoption because of the election. Now that the election is over, now that people are concentrating more, we are seeing this. We should remember that schools were closed for the election. I'm proud to the election. So because of that, people could not be kidnapped schools. So people were kidnapped yeah. on the highway. Yeah. People, uh, houses were really pleased to uh, uh, attend the and people were taken away. So that has not changed. Law. What we should and, be looking uh, at are what Hello? Mr. Lode, are you there? Yeah. So yes, I'm I pleased at the Japan NATO Corporation. All right, we seem to have some uh, interference there. That's why we're trying to ensure that uh, we get uh, clarity. But if you can hear us, just go ahead and make your point so we can, uh, we can uh, get the insight of your points, of course. What I was point. saying is that I would like to highlight. Should you take a break? Let's take it. We need to quickly go on a break. When we return, we'll continue this conversation with you. Do stay with us. All right, thank you for staying with us. Before we went on the break, we were speaking with Timitokwe uh, Ulodo, uh, who is in the UK, talking about he's a preventive terrorism consultant and president of Africa Security Forum. Uh, we're talking about the resurgence of uh, uh, attacks on some communities as well as some abductions that we have seen in recent times. And I asked before we went on the break if uh, what you interpret as the reason for the resurgence of these attacks. I recall that you mentioned that uh, there was no calm initially, but it's just a matter of the fact that we were not perhaps following uh, developments uh, from some of these uh, communities. Yes, exactly. And, and, and that's the truth. The fact was that a lot of people were concentrating on the election. There was a restriction of movement of people. Students were not in school. Because we should look at the pattern. You know, if they go to schools, they either pick them from their hostels and they go away with them. They are picking them on day, during the daytime. The question we should be asking is, what is the police effectiveness in terms of response rate to be able to deal with it? Because these people are not coming out of the moon and then disappearing into the moon. They are moving from one location to another, and it's not like they are, it's not like they are moving from junction A to junction B within one minute. They are going for a long distance, and yet we are unable to stop them. So 
So the question then is, what kind of intervention is government putting in place? And why is it that those interventions are not working? I think that is where we need to come from in order to be able to deal with this. Because at the end of the day, if there's a kidnapping or adoption that has gone on, the three questions we should ask ourselves is, these people are going to call. Who are they going to call? We've already put in a policy. A lot of Nigerians can remember the suffering they went through to be able to get their names, to be able to have a link. Yet these people are still making phone calls in this country. We were just talking, um, before I joined the, the conversation, you were talking about either telephone calls of people that have been tapped. We can tap some people's telephone numbers, but we can't tap some other people's telephone numbers. So it shows you the ridiculous of the system, or the security system that we have. You know, we talked about money. Why some people don't have money, and they are queuing up here. Some people are using money for parties, and spraying them in parties, in weddings. So you could look, and you could see the, 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 the challenges that we are facing. It's all what we need now, with the new administration coming in, is that we need to change our approach to tackling violence extremism in Nigeria, and ensure that we have interventions that will ensure that this issue of kidnapping will be a matter of the past. Because, of course, we know the student, but we also know the kidnapper. They are from a community. Somebody gave back to them. Why is it that they continue to do this and get away with it? Why is it that they are able to spend their money and go home to rest at night? Why is it that they are able to buy food? So there are some uh, conflict entrepreneurs that I imagine from this, and because the banks are not really helping, the government is not putting enough interventions. That is the reason why we're saying that this business is lucrative and people are joining it on a daily basis. All right. In the last uh, few years, we've seen massive investment in security, hardware, um, equipment, military equipment by the government. And uh, we, we were expecting that by now, uh, the, the security agents would have had adequate capacity to handle, mitigate, or avoid uh, this incessant uh, kidnapping that have been going on in parts of the country. I, I wonder what you make of, uh, of that. We have so much uh, military hardware, yet we're still having uh, this, this kidnappings, reported kidnappings here and there, and terrorism activity within uh, the country. How, what do you, how do you explain that? Any solution to a security challenge must be a people-led solution. Um, the, current sol the current approach that we're adopting is more of all the major uh, interventions that we're adopting is more of hardware. Hardware has a part to play, and I have no doubt in it. I've just talked about the fact that we need telecommunication systems that could work. But, sir, you can, Mr. Mike, you cannot go and kill a bush rat with an ammo tank. There are certain solutions that you need. One of the solutions, as I speak from you from Kent in the United Kingdom, if I am adopted in my house right now while I'm on TV, I can reassure you before you finish your, 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 your program, I'll, the people will have been spotted by a helicopter who is flying over there because the Police response rate is different. Where are they going to take me to in Kent? So we have what we call the containment strategy. Who is going to kidnap me? Because there are cameras everywhere. Because before you kidnap me, they, even from the control and command center of the police, they know where you are going. They're just going to be following you to wherever you want to go and stop. That is the problem we have. We have many ungoverned spaces, and we've not done anything to deal with those ungoverned spaces. Every time we want to deal with those of government spaces, we put in politics. Anytime we want to deal with the issue of, uh, I, I came into Nigeria a few weeks ago, so a few months ago, and even when the government said that people should not be selling SIM card, a woman at the airport who is working at the airport was trying to sell me an unregistered SIM card that I can use that for the few days I was here. So the question then is, the corruption in the system also has made it very, very difficult to be able to tackle it. I'm hoping that the new administration will not just look at this from a military or hardware perspective, but will look at it from a people-led people -led strategy. We need to have a strategy and we need to have an implementation plan. As we speak, and you've been doing this for many years, 
You cannot tell me what is the KPI, which you were talking about, of the minister of the commissioner of police in Lagos State. Nobody knows it. Nobody knows how it's measured. And the community do not come them to question. So those are the part of the challenge. I throw the question back to the security service because that is the family that I belong to. And I believe that they are not doing enough and they are not fit for purpose. I feel there's a need for a change in the approach that we adopt in dealing with the issue of violence extremism, particularly kidnapping. And once we put in the appropriate interventions that are needed, and I'm hoping that this new president will do, or coming president will do, they will see a drastic reduction in, in, in the issue of adoption and kidnapping in Nigeria. Because those people adopted, we should know their name. As I speak to you, all the people that are not working in the United Kingdom are known to the government. Because in one way or the other, they've engaged with them, they have their fingerprints. So when you say, oh, this person was a person that kidnapped me, his eyes is like this, his nose is like this, in less than three, four minutes, they could go and pick him up in his house. Because they know he's not working, they know where they put him, they know what kind of job they're giving him to be able to support him. I'm hoping that the new president coming in will not just be looking at just cutting off the head of the snake, but actually looking at social interventions and other initiatives that they could embed to ensure that everybody in the country is known. Let's not put politics into it. Let's not say that we need to increase the numbers in the north or increase the numbers in the east so that by the time we have election next time, there will be more numbers in the southeast. So, so that's the reason with the population sector that's coming. Let's do things properly like everybody is doing. Nigeria is a great people. With, it's a great nation and great people. And this issue of kidnapping is disgracing us as a nation. People like us are embarrassed because we have a lot of people both within and outside the country that could bring in fresh ideas. But when you have a commissioner of police or you have people that are meant to be handling this and people disappear and yet you can't find them and yet you can go to parties at the end of it and you are not losing your job, then you could see why we are unable to solve the problem of kidnapping and adoption in Nigeria. Now, there's the aspect of persons uh, who tend to undermine the efforts of government because uh, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, we yeah. must... I uh, admit that the government has done a lot with regards to addressing insecurity in the country. But you mentioned earlier that there are conflict entrepreneurs. There are people who seek to undermine the government's efforts, who act as moles in the system. How do we begin to address those people? Because whichever measure the government puts in place, they look at ways of beating it. Okay, there are two ways to deal with it. The first thing is that we need to deal with the inside, the, uh, we call them insider threats, which are people that work within the system that are actually the obstacle to the system working. Because uh, like I mentioned earlier, the government have done a lot to deal with this issue. So dealing with that, I could tell you as someone that worked as a police officer in UK with Kent Police, worked as a, uh, as a succumbent police to a uh, uh, individual with the Met Police and also work in the office for security and counterterrorism. I could tell you that foreign money or any kind of money cannot enter my account because on a six months basis, my, my bank statement is reviewed by my superiors. They ask me what I do or which country I'm going to because it's called security clearance. So if you ask, if you ask now how many Nigerians know the level of security clearance, that exists in Nigeria and what level the Commissioner of Police is or the Inspector General of Police is. So they have money, all of a sudden you see the uh, Inspector General of Police, I'm not saying this particular one, you see them riding Rolls Royce once they leave government. And you ask yourself, where did they get that money for? Don't we know their salary? So we need to deal with the inside threat and ensure that there is a department that looks into security clearance. Because you and me, we agree that some of the people that DSS have even cleared for political position, I will be clearing in the next few weeks, we will sit down and we will ask, how did this person clear security clearance? Because we know that this person has some packages. But yet, Nigerian security services seems to be able to clear those people. Then, the banks have a problem. Because as I speak to you today, if you send me money from Nigeria, which I'll be happy to accept <laughs> to be with my bills, but I tell you that within two, three months, if consistently I'm getting money that I can't explain, my account will be frozen. As I speak to you, people are doing 419 and collecting money from people, and people are going to the bank to complain that this person collected money from my account. This money comes out from this account. And the bank will do nothing until you go to CPN to report, and they see that their job is on the line. 
So those are the kind of changes that we need to do, both from a civilian perspective and from a security perspective. Because if we're able to close all those loopholes, then where would this money go? A lot of money have been collected. Billions of money have been collected by kidnappers. Yet, no one single person has been held accountable for the flow of those money. You can't tell me that you collect money as you've seen on TV, in, in movies and things like that. If you watch crime movies a lot, they will look at the serial number. They will collect the serial number. Because now that's why the kidnappers are asking for money in dollars, asking for money in social, so because they are trying to use different initiatives. And I know that is happening. I'm not blaming the government completely for this challenge, but that's the reason why I said this must be a community-led approach to deal with the issue of kidnapping with implementation plan that is open to all of us to interpret and understand. As we speak, Nigeria police have never in the last few years released statistics that we can rely on. So most of the statistics that we are relying on are individuals like my good friend who are, who are in the security services who are producing and re releasing results about kidnapping. As we speak, you or me cannot actually say that these are the number of people that are kidnapped by Nigerians because government has not actually given us an official uh, um, uh, figure on this. And why is it that they are not giving us? Because if they are giving us those figures, they will know that they are actually working to deal with that because we could say, oh, the Inspector General of Police said the numbers was in, in April was 2,000. But in, in May, the number has reduced to 900. Then we could appreciate them. But we don't even know where the figures are moving to because people are using different figures and people are basing it on information that is released to the public. Because most of the time now, people, victims, where families of victims are not even reporting the kidnapping. And even people that have been kidnapped or adopted when they are picked up, what kind of briefing do we do for them to be able to ensure that those individuals that were involved in that kind of activities are never are able to do such activities again. We're not doing that. We pick them up, we take them for medical, then we release them into the public. Those people are going through a lot of trauma. Nobody is supporting them. But we need to change that narrative. And I'm hoping the new administration will bring in people with the expertise, not just Nigerians that are being, that are being recycled, but people that have the expertise and skills. As I speak to you, even before the issue of de-radicalization started, before Nigerians know what was de-radicalization, I worked in that system for many years, working representing Her Majesty government, you know, on the issue of the radicalization. But what is happening? I have a lot of Nigerians that have worked and are part of my group that have worked in Afghanistan, that have worked in Iraq and other places. Why are we not bringing them and embedding them into the system? If I know the assured you that I know that we all know, we know that it brings in new talent. And I'm hoping that that is what it will do. That it will not fall into the trap of the presidency and use the same old bag and recycle them or bring in new ideas, new people that will bring you fresh ideas that will resolve the problem that we're facing today. All right, Timmy Sopo, uh, the we have seen uh, reports in that, in fact, the last few years, we've often heard of the issue of uh, terrorists surrendering, and then, you know, this, the, the security agents have a way of uh, uh, debriefing them and incubating them for a little while and then releasing them back into the society. Uh, some persons have said in, in the spirit of fairness and justice, and uh, especially for those who, have, who became victims uh, of, of attacks by those, those guys, that uh, is, is unfair and it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it shouldn't be. I wonder what you make of that in security uh, terms or from that perspective, how, how you guys work. Talk to us, explain it to us, let Nigerians understand how 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 it is done and how it should be done and how it shouldn't be done okay in the first instance the approach adopted by nigeria is completely wrong and i say from a place of authority as somebody that work in that system longer than any nigerian i'm saying it as an authority more than any of the military nigeria nigeria military that are actually doing it because i've been working in that system before nigeria even know what the term the radicalization is let me explain it in simple terms. What Nigeria is doing is the military picks people up, the military profiles this, those individuals, and the military release them back into the community saying that they are not clean. That is completely a wrong approach to de-radicalization. Because what should normally happen is that if people are suspected of being 
uh, uh, vulnerable to violence, extremism, or de-radicalization, they are picked up normally by the police, not even the military. But let's say, okay, the military is in the theater of war, so they come to the military. When they're picked up, there is a group of individuals that will say these people have been radicalized. And then you have community-based group, which is people like yourself who have worked either in the military before or have a specialist, a doctor, a psychologist. And then they'll say, okay, you bid for a project. You bid for that project, maybe $5 million, $10 million. And then they give you those people, and then you de-radicalize them. When you de-radicalize them, you put them through the program that you're meant to put them through, which have been approved. Then those people are interviewed, spoken to, and then if they are fit enough, you bring them back into the community. But that is different from what the military is doing because some of the people that the military are picking up are not even due for the radicalization project yet. Because if they have committed a crime already, they should first face the, face the sentence for that crime. While they are in prison, they are meant to be de radicalized in the prison, just like any other person that have gone into the prison go to rehabilitation, and if they are deemed to be fit for purpose, they are brought out, and then they can go, become valuable members of the community. Where communities are being sacked, families are being killed, and individuals come out from a, from a bush, and then you say, oh, they are part of the people that have committed the crime, and then you say you deradicalize them, you give them food, you give them chocolate, give them biscuits, give them chicken, and then you release them back into the community where they've committed crime, and the people could see that they have not actually been, they have not actually have any remorse for what they've done or go to prison. Why should anybody want to join your, uh, not want to join them? And I totally do not agree that 10,000 people can suddenly come out from nowhere and say they want to be de-radicalized. I personally believe that this is driven by money. Let me explain very simply. A whole community cannot be de-radicalized, cannot be radicalized. What is happening is that in some of those remote communities, maybe the, the Boko Haram or Iceworld people that are responsible for holding them in hostage left. And then the whole community comes out. What you should have done is you pick the ones that you believe have been involved in, in violence, extremism, and deal with them. But the children and other people are not radicalized. All they need to go through is just a program of rehabilitation. They are not radicalized, but in the Nigerian system, what they do is just lump the whole lot together. How can you tell me that 60,000 people need to be de-radicalized. There is no country in the world, including the UK, which is the expert in this field, have ever had such a number. Nobody. So what Nigeria is doing is, is, is just kidding themselves. That is not the way to do radicalization. And if that is even the case, let's even assume that is the case. Mr. Mike, have you seen the statistics about how many of those people, the 100 or 50,000 that they say they now have, how many of them have been de-radicalized? What kind of program they've gone to? As I speak right now, I challenge your viewers to go online and put the radicalization statistics, UK. They will see all the figures, the number of people that were picked up, the number of people that were deradicalized on a monthly basis. That was the job I was doing. I, was, I had a budget of close to three million pounds where I give it to community groups who have proven themselves to know how to do this deradicalization because some of those people might need just a religious deradicalization. Some of them might just need an economic intervention. Some of them might need mental inter intervention because they are vulnerable individuals that were picked up, and those people need to be dealt with in that manner. So there are different ways. But in Nigeria, it is the military that picks, it is the military that are light, it is the military that deradicalize, and it is the military that release. So it, but Nigerian deradicalization project is a project by the military, by the military for the military. That is the way it is. It's not for the community because if it's people driven, what will happen is that the community will be involved. They will know that the ones that need to be dealt with have been dealt with and faced the law and brought back. The radicalization simply is a process where you identify individuals who are meant to be vulnerable. You pick them up, deconstruct those individuals, and move, make them uh, valuable members of the community. As we speak, the Nigerian community cannot come out and show us 5,000 people. I challenge them. Out of all the people they've They've been de-radicalizing, according to them, in the last three years. Let them all show right. us 5,000. They don't even need to give us their full name. Just say, this one was picked up. This is what he's doing now. This one is picked up. This is what he's doing now. He has a, right. He's now employing 10, 15 people. All they do is show us one or two people. 
Well, it should be more than that because they're spending thousands of pounds and nobody's reviewing it. I'm hoping that Ashua led that administration we have to wrap we look into now. that place and address that issue because that is true right. corruption that is going on there. Preventive Terrorism Consultant and President of Africa Security Forum, Timitokwe Olodo. Thank you for your time on the program. Thank you so much for having me.